The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. Welcome everybody to uh, DIS2 this morning. Uh, thanks for joining us live here um, in the Zoom lecture. We uh, went into the window manager last week and talked about a few of the roles that it has. You might remember that. So um, to get you back into the groove, some of the things that we talked about for the window manager had to do with um, managing the session that the user is involved in. Um, and also, of course, uh, managing windows in the sense that it provides the user interface for the end user to interact with uh, what we call top level windows on the desktop. So you might remember that we uh, we're looking at a, a typical document window that would have, you know, close buttons, minimize, maximize buttons at the top. And those are the kinds of things that usually the window manager provides so that every top level window looks the same and the application doesn't have to worry about providing this kind of functionality. So when, you know, an application developer writes an app, they don't have to think about um, implementing, you know, the, the user interface controls for minimizing, maximizing, um, or even resizing the windows. They just have to say maybe that they want them um, because sometimes you may not want them. There may be a dialog box that you don't want people to resize because it doesn't make sense. But in general, you don't have to implement any of these. Uh, you just tell uh, your window system, please uh, have the window manager decorate these windows for me. So that's one of the big things and the second one as I said, is the, the session management, making sure to um, basically guide the user through the opening, closing of apps, you know, minimizing. Um, early window managers included the desktop, man, uh, the, the, the file system management um, in the window manager as well. These days, these things are typically separate applications. Um, one of the things that we uh, didn't get to last week when we talked about the window manager um, is late refinement. And uh, what I mean by that is the fact that when the window manager is accompanying the session, you know, changing window positions, possibly changing app appearance, um, this means that it has to have some way of letting different instances change the look of an application that is being, uh, being executed. Um, I'm showing a few examples here um, in this uh, screenshot of the kind of controls you might see that the user can, can set as preferences. You know, you can see here uh, in OS, Mac OS, you can um, you know, choose a light or dark appearance. You can choose um, what, you, what kind of color you wanna use for any accents, you know, the, the highlighting colors, um, what kind of, uh, whether you want to see the menu bar um, automatically and, and hidden and shown and so on and so on, you know, scroll bars. Um, these are all examples of things that you could set for all applications and then all the applications should follow that, that guide. You know, the light and dark appearance is a really good and fairly recent um, addition to, uh, as an example to this principle. So this means that there is now a bunch of different um, instances that are interested in, in changing things around uh, on how an application looks. And there are also uh, a few different levels of refinement that we want. Um, you might say that, um, you know, you might want to run uh, uh, you know, certain settings for um, all users of a system because, you know, typically you have a multi-user system these days or multiple people can log on to, to a computer um, and with their accounts. And you might say, okay, so there is a setting that I want for the whole session of a user to apply and I want it to apply for all the users. So it would be a system-wide setting, maybe, you know, a default uh, color of the, um, uh, the, the highlight color used for, for example, okay buttons, you know, the button that's highlighted to be executed with pressing the enter key. Maybe you want that to be blue by default. Um, so this could be system-wide information in some table, some configuration file that the window manager would then read and would then um, be able to forward to all the applications. Uh, the next thing might be that you set something for all of the users of a single, for a single application. So maybe there's some particular application 
where you want the, um, the, the highlight color to be something else. Um, maybe it's an emergency application. You want that application to have red um, highlighting instead of blue highlighting for all users of the system. So again, it would be system-wide uh, setting, but it should be described for one application. So there's to be a way to address the settings for one application, but for all users. Um, the next level would be that uh, users start having individual um, requests. So there should be a way to somewhere, somewhere store information uh, that a particular user has configured a particular application to use a particular highlighting form. Um, so maybe there is a user who's uh, colorblind and can, can tell red and green apart very well, um, and they might decide to choose a different highlighting color altogether um, for one application, or maybe they want this for all their applications. So that's something in a typical multi-user system you would store somewhere in the home directory um, space of a user or the user's uh, personal preference files. And then finally, um, a user might decide, okay, so right now um, I need this uh, application to come up with a different color, maybe because it's gotten dark and I want to use a different color scheme for it. Um, so per launch, an application should even be able to be uh, changed around. So typically the, this involves using some startup parameters, uh, options that, you know, that are passed onto the application when it launches, um, or some kind of uh, other description file that the user can provide when launching the application. And um, maybe to add to this, especially you know, in recent years, we've seen that systems have become more and more um, responsive in these changes that you can even change things around on the fly. So while the application is running, you may make a change. And then ideally, you would maybe even want that change to happen in the applications as they go. This doesn't always work because it's hard to build these toolkits and the, and the frameworks so that the applications keep continuously checking for these changes with all their interface components. Um, but it's an increasingly um, you know, required effect that, that users are asking for. So uh, how do you implement this late refinement? The late refinement, what it basically means is that you have some defaults and over several steps of, you know, of changes and, and, and change requests that difficult, different instances have, um, the system then in the end has to decide what kind of level, uh, what kind of um, choice for some kind of setting needs to be applied. Uh, the implementation of this um, is uh, fairly standard these days. Um, the most frequent thing is that you would see um, just basically structured uh, document files of some um, you know, XML version um, that describe these settings. And then um, what happens is that these, these you know, files are being read in. Um, in older systems, they used to be simple table files that would prep, uh, provide a particular setting. For example, we'll say background for all applications, you know, is or background in general is blue, but background for uh, the mail application should be green. Um, and the background for the, um, you know, OK buttons in the mail application should be blue, uh, should be red or something like this. Um, so those table files used to be the standard. You know, nowadays, it's used to, it's, it's more likely some kind of structured document like an XML file. Uh, but there's also another option um, to store this in um, a window manager's internal database, um, similar to what you might know from the Windows registry, for example. Um, now, choosing a, 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 a non-human readable uh, database rather than uh, textual description files has a couple advantages. Um, it means that you know, a, if it's a format that only a specific application can read and write, as is the case, for example, with the Windows registry, um, then you can, of course, apply certain um, sanity checks to those entries. So um, nobody can just go in and change some text around to something that's not valid in the text editor um, because the registry is an application that you can, uh, is a file that you can only edit with particular applications which can apply sanity checks on any input that's being done. Um, the problem with these registries, however, is and if you've ever used Windows and, and tried to dabble with the registry, is that uh, it's hard to get a clear sense of what is being stored where. It's not transparent um, to users of the system of what is going on. Um, and uh, that makes it sometimes difficult to find out where exactly do I need to change some setting uh, 
uh, to get to a certain effect. Um, it's more sort of a poking around and, and, and then people are sharing you know, the best hacks of changing the registry uh, in Windows for a particular um, effect. The other problem with that is, of course, and if you have a, um, a central registry, that means you have another place where you need to clean up if, for example, the user um, account is deleted. If the any settings for the user are just stored in this user's use home directory and read in as you know as part of the configuration when an application starts up, no problem. You remove the user, you remove your home their home directory, you're done. Right? You don't need to worry about it. If it's in a central database, you need to make sure to cleanly pull out any changes that that required um, or that were set for this particular person. Um, what we uh, sometimes see in these in these settings um, uh, file formats is also that uh, you might store a starting state, a default state, and then only save incremental changes. So in like a, a kind of delta technique, uh, where you could then even um, apply an undo, where you say just you know undo the last changes to this um, to these settings and then roll back to an earlier state. I want to give you an example of late refinement. Um, in the form of a uh, you know um, a read a human readable um, structured document file, um, I just pulled this out of um, my own um, you know user account uh, files in my home directory uh, a while ago, um, and it's uh, it's the macOS login window. Right? So what you can see here, um, th this is actually well not from my personal account on my Mac, but actually from the system wide preferences account. Uh, this is taken if you happen to have a Mac from slash uh, library slash preferences and then slash com.apple.loginwindow.plist. So it's, you know, it's named in a way that is fairly uh, self-evident. And let's read through this. And we've never seen, I'm assuming, um, uh, this kind of format. Um, but let's see how much we can just guess from what's going on here simply by reading the text. So you guys are all trained computer scientists. So... Tell me a few things about what you think these preferences stored here in this uh, login window um, preferences file um, mean. What, what is being configured here? Can anybody take a guess as to what kind of things are being um, set up here? Yeah, Christoph, go ahead. Well, I would guess it's settings from login window because the title says so and also I've used Max so I know does that those settings uh, are the things that you can see when you log into to your Mac when you open it mm -hmm. if, if the guest is enabled because on Mac you can have this guest account which will self-delete itself after it's logged out and is the, 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 guest, last... account, um, is the guest account active right now uh, no, because we see that the value for the key guest enable is false. Exactly. So since you, since you know that format, what do you think that the rest might be? Uh, well, it's, uh, it's a simple key value dictionary. So the last user is uh, locked in. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how to interpret it. Last username that was used to log in was uh, Porsches. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, retries until hint is pretty self-explanatory. Right. So you, you type your password one three times and then you get a hint uh, that you put into the system earlier on to remind yourself of your password. Right. So we can see that, you know, it, it is reasonably easy to follow along of what is being configured here at what level and what the settings are and what they mean. Um, and if I wanted to really tweak this, I could probably go in and say, okay, I'm going to write a script um, as a system administrator who's responsible for our network computers. I can go in and script, um, you know, an editor to change, for example, um, the, uh, uh, the last username uh, that should be selected to be always, let's say, I don't know, the name of the uh, administrator who was most recently logged in um, to you know, remove any traces of, of users who are logging in in between. Um, or you know, change the uh, fact that you get three retries before you get your password and those kinds of things. 
Um, so it opens up, you know, the tools that a computer scientist has at their uh, disposal to work with these preference settings and makes it easy to uh, use the power of late refinement um, with all the things that we can do as, as, as software developers and administrators. Um, so late refinement lets me uh, set up sort of this, this uh, chain of, of effects from system-wide settings, application-wide settings, user-specific uh, uh, user settings, and then may even launch-specific settings um, so that you know, things look the way that the end user wants, but if they don't specify any, any personal preferences, for example, then defaults uh, kick in that makes sense. Um, now, with the other parts of the Windows system architecture, the graphics event library, the base Windows system, it was pretty clear that they were creating these virtual machine layers uh, that, you know, one level was hiding the things of the levels below. Um, this is not quite so clear with the window manager. Um, the window manager uh, could be placed in the upper part of the base window system, meaning that it is essentially a client of the base window system that it uses its, uh, you know, its, its access functions that are made available, um, that it would um, basically um, be part of the, the core window system that's being provided. Um, so this saves a lot of communications overhead because if you make it part of that, that means essentially you're in the same address space, you're in the same process, um, maybe a separate thread, but in the same process so you can access things, um, you, can, you can use simple you know, method calls, um, shared memory is available, and so on. But uh, this tends to blur the boundaries a bit, and it gets a little bit more difficult to um, get a good overview of the architecture of the system, um, and also makes it less flexible, because it's harder to pull such a window manager out of the system and replace it with something else if I want some kind of completely different um, look and feel for my applications, maybe. Um, in this case, the window manager is basically, um, as part of the base, uh, base window system, is, is a server to the applications. Um, and uh, it can change the appearance of applications, because applications would then be talking basically to the base window system, but the window manager would um, be part of it. A second way to do this is to create the window manager as a completely separate process um, uh, that is a, a running um, application that communicates both to the base window system and to the application. Um, this makes the window manager easily exchangeable because we can now pull it out. It's a user level process, no longer a part of the, um, the, the core system. Um, but this increases, as we can see, the communication overhead, right? We now need to the application to talk to the base window system, the application to talk to the window manager, and the window manager talk to the base window system. Um, but pulling it out as a separate uh, process is still the way that, that, uh, uh, that operating systems are going these days. But what you typically see is that instead of having all this communication overhead in all directions, um, the window manager and the applications actually communicate using uh, shared resources in the base window system. So the window manager here is just another application like all the other applications without, if you want any, any special uh, communication structure. Um, and it uses the mechanism of shared resources in the base window system to talk to applications and to agree on, on things. Let me give you an example. Um, let's say, uh, a, um, the user launches a new application um, top level window. So in that case, the uh, window manager would receive that request because they're guiding the user to, uh, through the um, uh, launching and closing applications uh, to accompany the session as we saw earlier. Um, then it would basically request a window position from the base window system. Uh, it would check whether that window system position, uh, whether that window position is conformant with its own layout policy. So where it thinks these things, uh, this window should appear and could then request a position change um, if, if, if that is necessary. And the position of that window, of course, gets then communicated back to the base window system so that it knows where that position is. It needs to know that anyway, obviously, because it needs to know where, you know, clicks and et cetera, hit which, which window. Um, and then the application 
um, could use that window and draw in it. And usually the application itself doesn't even have to know where the window is, right? It's, it doesn't matter. On the one hand, this increases communication also, again, uh, uh, compared to the integration of the window manager into the, into the base window system. Um, but we have one and the same protocol, right? So applications are talking to the base window system, the window manager is talking to the base window system, and we're using essentially the same um, communication model. And, and this is nice uh, from an architectural point of view, we don't have any direct communication between the applications and the window manager. Uh, this is the model that, for example, we'll see in the X uh, window system. Um, but we also have other examples of more modern window systems where we can see how the window manager has been sort of moved out and can even be um, sometimes you know, replaced or at least relaunched uh, separately without bringing down the whole uh, window system. So uh, in conclusion, um, the window manager leads, he continu continues to lead us from this system oriented view that is very technical and about, you know, um, memory areas, et cetera, and resources up to a more user centered view of the window system, you know, more user oriented functionalities available, you know, buttons for moving things around, moving windows around, for example, um, or closing them, et cetera. Um, the other thing that the window manager does is it provides a variety of, uh, of consistency um, protocols. So it can make sure that all top level windows are decorated in the same style, you know, so that you will find your close button always on the right hand side or always on the left hand side, um, depending on whether you're using you know, Windows or a Mac. Mm -hmm. And um, it could potentially be exchangeable. So if the architecture allows for it and makes these connections um, clean enough, then we could actually, you know, pull out the window manager and launch a different one. And we'll actually do that uh, later on when we look at the X window system, which is a wonderful little uh, playground of, um, you know, experiments that we can do because the system is completely open and, and the source code is available. So there's a lot of things that you can tweak in it. However, um, let's say you write a window manager and you make sure that it all, it has this wonderful, you know, uh, Microsoft Windows style uh, cross and, and line and square in the right hand corner of each window um, to, you know, maximize, close and minimize. Um, <clears throat> this still doesn't mean that you have consistency with how the applications look inside. Because the window manager does not define um, user interface components like buttons or menus inside a window or um, scroll bars or things like this. Uh, so for that, we still need something else. And that is going to be the user interface uh, toolkit that is on the next level up uh, that provides this kind of look and feel consistency across applications for anything going on inside the top level window. Um, when I when I talk about consistency, I should maybe add that um, consistency has a variety of different kinds. Uh, the one that is most obvious is visual consistency, meaning that simply you want things to look the same across applications. I don't want different you know close buttons on different windows. Um, that makes you know it easier to to learn applications and and uh, to get up to speed in using them. But you also want behavioral consistency. So. I want to be able to close every application in the same way. And I'm not sure whether you guys are old enough to remember this, but in early versions of Windows, when you know the graphic user interface just started out, uh, you would often see that some applications you would exit with uh, pressing Control X, others you would exit with Control E, others you would exit with Control Q, and others you would you know exit with I don't know Alt F4 or something like this, right? So there was this time when people were implementing these things in a very inconsistent way and you could not really rely on uh, one command being applicable to all the applications for the same uh, function. So that's something that clearly uh, the window manager can also support providing this kind of behavioral consistency. Um, or the fact that you know a right click will always lead you to some kind of context menu, those kinds of things. You can still see those inconsistencies today 
if you launch applications on, on your host computer uh, that are written with some kind of cross-platform cross toolkit. So if you've ever used a Java app on Windows or a Java app on Mac OS, then uh, you know that they feel different and they look different and they behave differently. Um, or if you know you launch things like you know X-based applications using an X window manager on top of Mac OS or Windows, then you can also see this like inconsistency. It's very confusing and uh, really throws you off in using your system com competently. The third thing of the way of consistency that that we should keep in mind is essentially uh, description consistency. So um, how do I define um, the background color of uh, a window, for example. Um, so the syntax and semantics of configuration files um, or, or maybe uh, of the database uh, that's being used to store these configurations should be consistent across all levels of refinement. If anybody has ever used Unix or Linux and played with config files for different tools, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because every command line application under Unix tends to have its own slightly different format for specifying uh, configuration options. And that is just incredibly annoying um, to, to work with. So uh, that's an ex these are examples of um, you know, the kinds of consistency that you might wanna see. Um, and usually that requires you um, or the, the Windows system developers to define some kind of special language that explains how uh, this kind of uh, description is being done. In the case of, for example, um, you know, Mac OS, we saw that the, uh, the format for specifying these kinds of things was essentially um, an XML document def definition type, uh, a DTD um, a document type definition, sorry, uh, that, that tells you how these things are being specified. So to conclude, uh, we've seen what the window manager is doing um, on the level of uh, uh, the look and feel. It provides um, an appearance to windows as a whole um, and decorates them. And it provides some kind of behavioral consistency. Um, uh, it uses techniques like you know, pop-up menus at a click or tiling versus overlapping window managers, for example. Uh, we'll talk more about these when we get to some uh, concrete examples of window systems. Um, and it on its on its lower levels, you know, down down the uh, uh, the pipe, basically, it's uh, fetching events from the base window system uh, and may thing, send things like uh, re the request of a position change of a um, of a window. So that closes up the window manager, and this that gets uh, this gets us to the last part of our reference architecture. Uh, which is actually the one that is probably most interesting to you guys because it's the one that you have most frequently, um, that you interact with most frequently when you write applications. And this is the user interface toolkit. The UITK or user interface toolkit is something that consists of um, widgets, um, so user interface toolkit components like buttons, etc. cetera, but uh, it consists of much more. Um, it, it provides these basic widget types like, um, you know, a label to put uh, text into or a button or, 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 or menu, uh, a menu item, but it also provides techniques to compose these uh, basic widgets into more complex ones to build things like, for example, a dialog box um, and to refine them, which means to change their behavior or, or, or tweak them to subclass them oftentimes um, to do different things. So you might want um, a button to look slightly different or to behave slightly differently um, when, it's, uh, in, in, when it's a different kind of um, application scenario. What's also included in the UITK is typically um, interface guidelines, meaning, you know, a book, um, a collection, a document that tells you how to use these widgets. And if you are working with a new window system for the first time, writing an app for it, I would really recommend taking a look at this uh, guideline document because it'll explain to you how to properly use each component. Um, when graphical user interfaces became widespread, especially we saw this effect when they, when they hit the internet you know, with, with more and more complex uh, graphical user interfaces being used in web apps, um, you saw all these wonderful mistakes that people would make um, like, you know, they wanted to put some text on a, on a page, 
and they would use a, a text editor widget. And all of a sudden, a, you know, a, a, an informational message that was uh, displayed was actually editable by the end user, which makes no sense at all, right? Um, so to avoid these mistakes, it makes sense to familiarize yourself with the toolkit, with the widgets and how to use them, um, what they're meant for by taking a look at the interface guidelines. So what the UATK does motivationally is essentially providing an API to the application developer to build apps that use, um, you know, that, that work with a graphical user interface on this window system. So it's definitely now at the level where it needs to be problem uh, you know, oriented and, and user oriented rather than hardware or base window system specific. And here's a number that I find scary. Um, many studies have shown, and this hasn't changed fundamentally, unfortunately, that 50 to 70% of the development in software actually go into the user interface, which should be great news to you because it means that, you know, learning how to write good user interfaces means you're never going to be out of a job. Um, but it also means that providing really good software support for building user interfaces quickly and building high quality interfaces that are consistent and that work the way that they're supposed to work is really crucial for an effective developer experience. And um, you know, I can't say this often enough. Did you guys see the uh, Wirtschaftswoche ranking that I think just came out last week or something, just a few days ago? Um, the computer science department at Erwitsche Hachen uh, is number one in Germany. Um, you know, just something to let you guys pat yourself on the back. You picked the right university. Congratulations. Um, so uh, this means that, you know, the Wirtschaftswoche is asking people from um, hiring uh, departments and companies um, who they would like to hire, uh, you know, engineers from. And in this case, in the case of computer science, they said, yeah, if we can get somebody from Aachen, then that's our first pick. So great news. Um, so you will be highly paid uh, developers. Uh, you'll make a lot of money. You'll cost a lot of money, which also means that if you're writing applications using a UI toolkit, um, that toolkit should be effective to support you as efficiently as possible so that you can write your apps quickly and without many problems of, you know, that you have to debug. So a UITK's primary goal should be of course, to create a great user experience for the end user running the app that uses the toolkit, but also for the application developer to be, you know, a good support for writing code. A word that we keep coming across uh, now is uh, widget, and widget itself is is sort of a uh, an artificial word, if you want, a construction. Uh, it was created from the uh, combination of the words window and gadget. Now a gadget is just a generally useful thing. Um, and uh, a, win you know, a window gadget means it's a useful thing to make, uh, you know, window based applications. So what the UI2K is getting from, from the bottom is uh, event positions, of course, you know, it gets, it gets things like, you know, this button was clicked on or, or this, this, um, um, you know, slider uh, scroll bar was being dragged or something like this or there's text entry that goes into this active current uh, window and it has to deal with these um, and show their effects to the user and then of course also it has to trigger things it has to trigger drawing requests like you know if the user interface changes if the user changes the position of a window or something like that or resizes it um, these kind of things need to be reflected in the various components you may have to rescale a window or move some buttons around, move them closer or farther apart if a rescaling is happening, uh, depending on what the policies are that, that are implemented. And of course, at some point, these applications have to do something useful, right? They're not just user interfaces. They have some business logic behind them. Uh, so you know, somehow these uh, UITK um, uh, components, the widgets also need to trigger, uh, of course, business actions. Let me show you some examples. The thing that most people um, think of when they think of the user interface toolkit <clears throat> is, is the UI2K's uh, widget set. Now, a widget set is, is an important concept, and you'll find that with every user interface toolkit. It's the collection of 
components you can use to build graphical applications with it. Um, on the left-hand side, we can see some uh, user interface components that are available in the, um, you know, in, in Xcode and in the, in the Mac OS developer environment um, that you can use to create applications with. And you'll immediately, you just look at them and, you know, if you've any, ever used the system, you can probably tell, oh, that, that's from the Mac, right? Not be ju just because it says Macintosh HD at the bottom, but also just because the visual style is usually very specific. And you can do the same thing if you look at a Windows 10 user interface or if you saw a Windows 7 one and you wanted to tell the two apart, even that would be something that is fairly obvious at, you know, just from the visual appearance. Um, similar thing, of course, on mobile platforms, right? You look at a, an interface uh, collection of, of widgets and you can immediately tell whether it's, you know, iOS 6 or iOS 7 and up because, you know, the flat design kind of hit um, at that version um, level. Uh, the right-hand picture here is showing you a second thing that's an important part of the user interface toolkit, and that's the user interface design system. Uh, here we're showing you Visual Studio Blend, um, which is uh, a tool that lets you build a user interface tool, a uh, user interface uh, for an application graphically. This is today the state of the art, of course, to do that graphically and not ask people to code the interface in text, because you know building a user interface is a very inherently graphical activity. Uh, you need to shift things around. They need to be visually well aligned. Um, remember all the uh, things we said in the visual design lecture um, in DIS one. Um, those things you want to see in a user interface uh, of an of an existing application. So uh, you need a visual representation of the of the UI that you're designing as an app developer to to make sure that it looks well. Um, and typically, these UIDSs, these user interface design systems, help you. Uh, with uh, a bunch of techniques to build your interface um, following the style guide. So the style guide kind of is your, is, your, is your guideline, is your prescription of how your interface should look like and what it should, how it should react. And the UIDS, the user interface design system, is the tool that ideally helps you make an interface that follows these guidelines. So the more of the guidelines can be encoded into the UI design system, the better, of course, because then the app developer doesn't have to think of them. It just gets applied automatically. A simple thing for that could be, you know, the right default colors and behaviors for, for buttons. And when you drag in a button, then it will work the following way. It will invert in the following way when it gets, you know, moused over and it will invert the following, you know, or it will highlight and, and invert when you click on it. Um, all those kinds of things are defined. Um, Visual Studio Blend has an interesting feature that you see rarely. It actually lets you even do, uh, draw your own vector paths and use those uh, vector paths, those vector um, shapes, as widgets in your own user interface. So on the one hand, that's really cool because I can draw this, this like weird, strange green blob there at the top is also um, in a user interface component. It could be used as a button. Uh, and maybe I have an interface where I need this. On the other hand, it also invites the creation of interfaces that don't follow the standard guidelines and that users might find confusing because they don't look like everything else they're used uh, to on that platform. But just to show you the kind of things that are possible these days. Um, good user interface design systems go one step further though, uh, and they don't just give you a chance of visually configuring your UI like you know, shifting buttons around and arranging dialogues, et cetera, but also let you link the interface to your code. Because when you press a button, then something needs to happen, obviously, in your code. Uh, and that link is something that modern UI devices also let you uh, specify so that you can you know, create that link between your interface and your code um, using the graphical toolkit without having to go in and remember you know, resource numbers or something or uh, um, widget IDs or something like that. So we got a couple uh, requirements for a, for a UITK, for a user interface toolkit. Um, a good user interface toolkit provides you with widgets that are composable. Um, what that means is, of course, I need to be able to place, you know, a few buttons and maybe an icon and a text field inside a box to make a dialogue. If I can't do that, then um, it's useless. 
this means also that there have to be these kinds of container widgets uh, that can hold other widgets as children in, in the widget tree. Remember the tree hierarchy we talked about on the level of base window system windows. The same thing applies here. If I place a button inside another window, like a dialog, and I want it to be attached to that dialog and move along with it, then it has to be linked in typically as a child of that parent uh, container widget. And where it is, how it gets resized, how it gets moved along, um, needs to be specified as a, a relation between the container and the button. Widgets, of course, should also be highly reusable. You want a standard array of widgets um, that you can um, use for you know, pretty much most of your application needs, so that you, the standard uh, stuff is all provided. But if I create a custom widget, if I subclass something or otherwise refine a, an existing widget into something else, I want to be able to use that also uh, at you know, many locations in my app. So I want to be able to create my own custom widgets based on what's already being provided to me. Uh, this still means that it should be, of course, uh, possible to uh, do that consistently so that I don't have um, differences in the radical difference in the behavior of the widget from one use to its next. Widgets need to talk to each other as well. So widgets are actually kind of complex little um, objects uh, that are more, uh, tr that are trickier than you might initially think. They're not just, oh, draw a button and wait for a click, but they need to communicate with other widgets. If I have a button um, sitting next to three other buttons, um, and space gets you know, squeezed because the window that they're in uh, gets you know, squeezed together because of a resize, maybe they need to shrink. Uh, maybe they all need to shrink by the same amount, but maybe there's a minimum width that each of these guys needs to display the text that's on them. And an okay button might end up being able to shrink more than another one. You know, if that's something that the developer wants for visual consistency, it might be weird if buttons are different widths. But you know, these are things that need to be um, negotiated between windows. And if I have a, a text field for a search bar, for example, standard thing is a search bar where you type some text and behind that you have a button to press to hit search, then you want that button to stay available and basically at the same size, whereas the search bar can extend if the window gets, you know, be made, uh, is, is prolonged and gets made wider. And the search bar can hold more text whereas it makes no sense to make the search button bigger and bigger because, you know, why would you? Um, so you can see there's, especially with resizing widgets, there's an interesting negotiating back and forth on how uh, each window, each widget should change its, its um, geographical, you know, geometrical parameters, sorry. Applications that uh, use a good widget set should also be reusable. What that means is if I have a good widget set, uh, a good user interface toolkit in general, then I can isolate the uh, UI code in uh, some specific parts of my application and I can sort of pull that out and replace it with a different platform and leave the business logic of my application, you know, whatever it might be doing uh, as it is. You know, if you wrote, um, uh, an application to to manage you know a student database then you would want that student database application to be independent of the concrete user interface that you need to provide for it um, and that a good widget set uh, uh, provides that this separation uh, used to be really difficult with procedural um, toolkits so we don't just have object-oriented languages and procedural languages, which you all know, uh, but we also have object-oriented toolkits and procedural toolkits. Because believe it or not, but you can write an object-oriented toolkit with a procedural language. Um, that has been done. If, uh, I had to use one of those. Uh, it's a little ugly, but it works in the sense that it provides the benefits of object orientation, um, even though you are uh, in using these widgets, even though you're still programming with a procedural language. Um, if you have a procedural toolkit, typically, you know, procedural language means procedural toolkit because very few toolkits go through the effort of creating an object oriented layer um, on based on a procedural language. If you have a, a procedural toolkit, which you might still often encounter in simple systems, you know, low powered embedded systems that don't have the uh, you know, the muscle to, to handle object orientation with all its abstractions and memory and processing requirements. So if you have a procedural toolkit, 
you'll find that it's actually quite difficult to separate your application UI code from your business logic. Uh, simply because objects are such a nice way to encapsulate behavior along with data structures. Um, if you don't have that, um, as in procedural programming, then it gets uh, tricky to pull these things apart nicely. In object-oriented toolkits, you'll find that much easier because essentially a widget, um, like a button that is programmed in an object-oriented way, uh, can have the methods attached to it uh, to handle certain UI actions uh, directly. Right? You don't have to worry about them. So that encapsulation works really well to pull UI code and, and, and business logic uh, apart. All right, so I want to uh, see if we can do a little um, in-class exercise here. Uh, but before we get to that, we'll take a five-minute break to give you guys some fresh air um, and uh, stretch your muscles and uh, open the window, walk around a bit, um, and you know, socialize with whoever might be there. I'll see you again in five minutes. Okay, uh, so let's continue. Um, and uh, what I'd like to do is a, uh, just a second, a little exercise um, that we can try out maybe. Um, when, we, when we think about widgets, um, a good way to imagine a widget in an abstract way is to say, that it is essentially a tuple of, of a bunch of different things. Um, what you need to specify in a widget um, is, first of all, some windows, meaning base window system level windows. So not your fully decorated you know, um, uh, windows that you see and, and when, you, uh, when you launch an application, but actually just let's, let's think of them as rectangular areas on the screen. So a typical widget uh, consists of uh, one or more windows on the space window system level. Uh, the second thing that it needs to include are uh, graphical attributes. So those are things that specify what that uh, widget looks like. The uh, third thing that you might need are, or the third and fourth are actions and um, inputs. So essentially telling you uh, what kind of events does this widget react to? And then how does it translate these incoming events into things that it triggers itself you know, in terms of actions? This might be a little um, abstract. So let's take a, a, a look at an at an example um, for, for a button. So first thing I'd like to uh, think about with you guys, and I'll, I'll just take some uh, recommendations if you wanna raise your hand. Um, if we have a, a typical uh, a button in a user interface, what do you think um, do we need in terms of a base window system level windows? So what kind of needs do we have for windows on that on that level. Yeah, Moritz, go ahead. So we need at least one window for the actual uh, outline of the button. And I don't know if the label counts as one as well, but otherwise I would think we just have one uh, mm -hmm. rectangular block, one rectangular box. Yeah, so what, what you're describing is very much in line with the, uh, with the, the, the modern look of most uh, window systems. Um, you will certainly need one window uh, where the button as a whole is being displayed. Um, and then it depends on how the button is implemented. Um, if the button is being designed as sort of an extension, as a subclass you could typically expect um, of a label, then it would already have um, a, a, a text field, so to say, where you, where you render something into it. Um, it could, and then you would have to have that separate um, widget in there. If, however, it says that it, uh, a button actually includes a label as a, so a button is essentially a composite widget that includes a label widget, then the label widget would take care of that other uh, window area. One thing that 
uh, would still be missing is if you look at um, um, uh, you know, some uh, 3D, uh, pseudo 3D interfaces or modern ones that use things like drop shadows is that you sometimes also see, uh, for example, a shadow being uh, displaced uh, compared to the, the main, uh, main button. So um, what, I, what I mean by this is maybe I can sketch that real quick. Um, <clears throat> Let me see here, share whiteboard. So you might have you know, a very simple button might look like this and then have you know, essentially just be a text label. So you wouldn't need a separate uh, widget because that uh, uh, frame is already where the text goes. Um, and then if there is a second uh, drop shadow, you know, old school widgets uh, in like this uh, two and a half D look, would we'll do it like this and place say, basically a second window slightly off to the right and to down uh, here by let's say a you know, pixel or two um, to create this sort of drop shadow, which would then also you know be uh, be used to to push into and and, and create a nice um, effect. Or modern uh, uh, window systems sometimes don't have this like clear rectangular drop uh, um, clear rectangular um, shadow here, but might have a alpha blended drop shadow. That reaches beyond the uh, basic text window um, uh, itself. So, one or more, uh, let's say, um, stopping the share here, uh, one or more of these kinds of uh, uh, windows you would certainly need at least at least one to to put the text into. So. Um, Let's get to the next one, uh, graphical attributes. What kind of ideas do you have for graphical attributes that you would want to specify on a simple button? Yeah, Miguel, go ahead. Um, I think maybe the button size or background color, maybe the padding. So the space between child base windows and the parent window. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Font sizes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we'll we'll get to the padding in a in a, in a moment um, because that is actually um, it's, it's a very common thing to have for HTML components uh, these days. Um, not so typical for um, for user interface components and graphical uh, user interfaces in uh, in these desktop window systems. The reason for that is that usually the padding, as you call it. Uh, the relative, you know, spacing of of uh, uh, parts is usually specified by the parent uh, that applies a certain layout or um, arrangement policy or spacing policy to its children, uh, and that's where you would typically then find where how the padding is being um, defined. Uh, but the other ones, uh, right on. So uh, we've got, you know, the size of it, which means typically an X and Y uh, extension of, for a typical, you know, rectangular button. Um, um, its color, um, background, foreground color, uh, what kind of font is being used to render the text on the button, uh, if it does have a shadow, what kind of color is that, um, etc. So there could be more of these, of course, uh, but those are some examples. And now it gets a little more interesting. Um, let's talk about what could be things that this button, well, maybe let's first talk about the eye, right? the, the, the input. What kind of things uh, would this button have to react to? Yeah, Moritz, go ahead. Uh, definitely a click on the button and maybe also uh, hovering over the button. Mm -hmm. And maybe um, you have to differentiate between like uh, the moment it's clicked and then when it's being clicked, like the click is holded, then the button needs to stay indented, kind of. And then uh, just when it's released, then it has to react again and be, become the normal state again. Right. So we got uh, basically push down and 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 release as uh, two inputs. Um, you also mentioned the the hovering state. Um, now hovering is a state, right? Um, what kind of events would we have to look for? Yeah, just go ahead, Moritz. Yeah, maybe the mouse movement then. 
Uh, yeah, mouse movement in general, of course, oh, but position. there would be, yeah, there would be uh, the, the, the position, uh, but there would be two uh, separate typically events that you would look for uh, that the mouse, uh, that the button would, would have to react to. I, I, I pass, I don't know. Yeah, Ritwick, go ahead. I think that will be the entry and exit, like the mouse enters the button and exits the button. Very, quite quite simply, really. Um, you know, you typically have an enter callback and an exit callback when the mouse enters the, the area of the button and then another one when it leaves it again. Uh, we'll talk about this a little more in, uh, in later uh, slides. Um, this is actually a tricky business uh, of what exactly happens there. Uh, but those are some things that you would need. And then uh, finally, if we know these are the things that happen to the button that it needs to react to, what are the things that you think the button itself needs to uh, needs to trigger? Now I, you need to think about at some point you want some part of your application to be executed. Let's say it's a it's a, a, a quit button, right? A quit button to 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 I don't know quit your application. Um, so at some point it needs to, you know, call some code then that, that, uh, you know, the application really quits or it's a button that opens a file, uh, selection dialog. So you need that to be happening. Uh, so what are the kinds of things that the button needs to provide as, as output, if you like, as, as signals, um, that other parts of your code could then react to? Signals may be the wrong word. Um, the way that is typically implemented is that there are lists that then applic the, your application code can uh, hook into so that when that particular thing happens, your application code gets called. Um, Johannes, go ahead. Uh, I mean, it needs to show that there was a click action. Mm -hmm. For example. So, I mean, I so guess the callback, right? Like yeah, the, the, the callback um, is, is the sort of the magical word here um, for having been clicked, right? Yeah. Um, so that is interesting. And in many cases, um, you don't need um, a callback, uh, you know, something to be executed in your code in response to a button being pressed down. Because often, you know, usually buttons only react when you let go. Um, and you know, then you need the feedback that, oh, the button got clicked, so pressed and let go again. So now we, we the user wants this thing to, to happen. Uh, can somebody think about a case where you might want to actually get the feedback that the button was pressed and not just, um, that it was pressed and released again? Yeah, Kai, go ahead. I want the button to do something for a certain time while it is pressed. So, um, uh, you might need to get a little closer to your mic, Kai. Uh, we can hardly hear you. Sorry, I forgot I took, took that off. Um, if I want something to go on for a time and then stop when I release the button, then I obviously want to know when the button is clicked and not just when it's released. Exactly. So like a something I press and then, you know, a counter increases until I let go or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. So, so that's when we might also need to know, know that under certain circumstances. Um, and then finally, if you think about things like um, uh, tool tips, you know, you all know tool tips, right? You know, things that pop up over, over buttons. Could you think about additional callbacks that you might need to, um, to implement tooltips, assuming that you know the the the, the button doesn't handle tooltips itself. If it's a if it's a nicely made um, object that can already pop up a tooltip by itself, then you don't need to know about it in your application. You just put some text into that, and then the button takes care of it. But let's assume that the button actually doesn't provide you know that the UI GK doesn't provide these tooltips, and you want to implement them. Then you would have to know about some other things as well. Yeah, Johannes, go ahead. Uh, just a question. When you mean tooltips, do you mean something you hover over 
and then yeah yeah an, an explanatory text that appears when you hover over a user interface okay. component okay mm -hmm. and you would need something to check when it enters or a callback for when it enters and then for when it leaves i guess as well exactly yeah so enter and leave you would need um because then your application would have to react to that and display and remove the tooltip so we can see there's a bunch of things we need to do with that and uh, we talked about some of these um, uh, triggers here as well. Uh, one that we didn't mention was um, you may actually have uh, the need that the uh, the button can also be triggered uh, with a with a key, with a keyboard combination, or with with a command key or something like that. So that and that could trigger the same thing as being clicked with the mouse, but maybe you want something else to happen. Um, so those are just some examples of things that would go into these windows graphical attributes, um, actions, and, and inputs of, of a, a typical UITK component. So what every uh, toolkit provides you are these basic widgets, right? Um, you know, push buttons, menus with menu items, check boxes, radio buttons, scroll bars, those kinds of things. They're predefined by the UITK and provide controls that are universal, that you can use as in many different cases, and that usually are independent of the particular application domain. Uh, in the early days, uh, that, you know, those kinds of widgets that were available were really limited. You might have a button, a radio button, menu, scroll bar, but now uh, there are way more of these predefined widgets. You know, you get sliders, you get steppers, you get date pickers, those kinds of things are all made available to you already. Um, so you don't have to worry about them. A special case of the basic widgets is the container widget. Uh, when uh, when you mentioned the uh, the, you know, the possible need for um, you know padding that needs to be inside a um, you know, that needs to be specified along a button, uh, I was mentioning that we need that this is done by the container widget typically, right? Um, a container widget can hold a set of child widgets and will lay them out according to some policy. Uh, and the layout strategy or layout policy that the container implements actually is its defining characteristic. So in many cases, you find a whole bunch of container widgets inside a, a UITK that each define a different kind of way of laying out its children. You know, one might be a stack uh, panel that just puts all uh, of its children underneath each other. Or another one might be, you know, a row column widget that just lays them out next to each other until it runs out of space and then wraps around and puts the next one. Um, another one might be the one that you may know from Java, you know, the frame that, uh, you know, puts things in the north, south, east, and west corners, and in the middle where you can put like five children um, in, into these locations. So there's a whole bunch of these different uh, layout policies typically that are implemented in these containers. But that's still all considered um, basic widgets. Um, basic in the sense that they're typically not made up of uh, by themselves of multiple other widgets, but just are a single uh, are a single widget. Now, how do we get to more complex widgets? You know, obviously, if I want the user to pick a color, I don't want to reinvent uh, this this color wheel picker every time. I want this really to be available as something that the uh, UI toolkit provides to me. But how do I do that? Um, how do I get to a uh, to a way to see um, to see that date picker? Sorry, to see that uh, that color wheel. Well, um, in the case of the color wheel, if we look at it, it really contains a bunch of smaller things, right? It contains, for example, a slider apparently for setting the brightness uh, there in the, uh, right in the lower third, uh, and another one for its opacity. So these are two slightly differently controlled uh, configured sliders. And then there's a uh, a display of a number um, that I can presumably also edit by text if I wanted to enter a precise number like 53%. So these things look like basic widgets that have been composed together into a larger one. Another example of that would be a typical file save dialog, right? A file save dialog contains some standard components that are not exciting. Um, they are all parts uh, that are typically provided as basic widgets and you compose them together um, in order to create a complex widget that is your file safe dialog that you can use. So the composing is one thing. Typically you use a container and then you throw a bunch of basic widgets or other compo uh, composed, already composed widgets in there to build your composed widget. 
The other way to do that would be um, refinement. Refinement is often done via subclassing. Uh, and it means that I take an existing widget type that exists uh, and I subclass it in, and change some of its uh, visual or behavioral characteristics. Um, so here on the right, we see three examples of buttons that could all be derived from the basic push button that, it, uh, that a UI tool, toolkit provides. Um, you know, the buy button that has this, you know, um, two color uh, design or the round plus button that has a completely different shape with just a single uh, visual glyph in there and has a drop shadow or the minimal button that is actually nothing more than text and some highlighted color um, on which we're hoping that the user will recognize it as a button. Very common in today's um, mobile user interfaces. So composition and refinement are the two key techniques to create more complex widgets. Um, this leads me to a difference of two kinds of hierarchies uh, that I think is really important to understand um, and that people often tr struggle with, but it's, it's not that difficult actually. Um, the first hierarchy that we see evolving here is the hierarchy that I call the dynamic widget hierarchy. And this hierarchy exists because when you build an application and you create, um, you know, its user interface, for example, here we have a window uh, called software update with three buttons in the, in the corner, which the window manager probably provided. Um, and then we have a text there um, and we have two buttons and we have a scroll bar. That uh, window was apparently created from elementary widgets, from basic widgets, um, and was composed into this shape. This creates a, a tree hierarchy, right? Um, the top level here is the is called uh, is a, is of the class window, so that's one type of user interface component. Um, as a top level window, it automatically gets decorated by the um, window manager, so the close, maximize, minimize buttons we don't have to worry about. And then that window contains two things: it contains um, a layout container um, and a scroll container. The scroll container is the one at the top. The layout the one container is the one at the bottom. You, can normally not, you, you cannot normally see these container widgets. They're usually invisible. They just provide space and a layout policy. Um, in the scroll container, we then have a text field. Uh, and the fact that it is scrolling is something that the scroll container automatically adds to it. Uh, whereas the layout ed container contains two buttons um, at the bottom that are being laid out you know, flush right, basically, with, a, uh, with varying uh, width. So this is called a dynamic widget hierarchy. Why is it dynamic? Well, it's, it's dynamic because you create this widget hierarchy uh, at runtime. These are objects that are being instantiated of these different classes in your application somehow. They, create, they, are create, they exist as software objects in memory and they are linked together with some kind of pointer mechanic usually to create this tree um, structure. Um, the tree is defined by these parent and children relationships between widgets, obviously. Um, and usually the widgets that you that are active, that you can see and that you can interact with are usually at the leaves of this tree. You can see here in the end, the leaves of this tree are just a text field and two buttons. And these are um, the things that you can interact with. Well, the scroll bar is kind of cheating here because it gets added by the scroll container. Um, the uh, this tree could even change at runtime, right? If I wanted to, I could create the tree for a dialogue that pops up like this one at runtime when that corresponding function is being called in my, in my code and I need to display this window, I could put it together there and then with complete, you know, with calls into the API of the UI toolkit. Um, that is a little bit um, more work um, than using a graphical layout toolkit and creating them, uh, creating them um, upfront in the UI design system, but I could do that. I could also mm, use a system where I can specify the layout ahead of time with a graphical toolkit, store it as a resource file, and then read in that resource file, but still only create the actual objects at runtime at the moment when they're needed. Typically, and this was something we already talked about in the base window system level, this dynamic widget hierarchy 
matches the geographical constraints, uh, sorry, the ge geographical contains relation of the underlying base window system trees. So what that means is that typically a child, like this uh, remind me later button here, or the update now button, cannot escape the geometric constraints, the confines of its parent. Um, and usually, if you look at a widget on this level, it will correspond to either a single base window system uh, window, or it could also correspond to a whole subtree of base window system windows. We already saw that even as you know, the, your, your simple little button could be actually two windows uh, put together for the text you know, and, and its, its shadow, for example. And um, you know, certainly, the, uh, on the other hand, uh, the, the text field, for example, is probably a single uh, base window system level window, and the scroll bar is already the next base window system level window. And why is this contained relation, relation interesting? Well, because um, if an action uh, is applied to a, a widget, it usually applies, you know, it, it takes any actions, like for example, being clicked as a very simple example, uh, a widget will receive these clicks across its entire geometric uh, space, except where a child widget is sitting um, on top of it. What I mean by this is if you take the software uh, update window um, and you, you consider, uh, let me see, I think I can annotate this here somehow. Do, 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 do. Uh, no, it doesn't, um, doesn't work that easily. Sorry. Uh, okay. So uh, for the for the software update window, the software update window um, has this uh, this top level window, and in general, it would receive all the clicks, but it is covered in full um, or almost in full by something else. So the scroll container is the is the top one. The white area essentially is the scroll container, and it also is covered completely with the text field and the scroll bar. So the text field and scroll bar are the ones that will receive all the events in this space. There's nothing left um, that the scroll container could, re uh, where the scroll container would be basically peeking through and be visible and could receive clicks. Um, on the other hand, if you look in the gray area, um, the, the layout container there at the bottom is, includes two um, of these buttons. But if somebody clicks in the gray area next to these buttons at the bottom, then that would, first of all, go to the layout container. And if the layout container says, I don't know what to do with that, uh, then that click would be passed on to, um, to the window as its parent. So basically events come in at the, at the leaves and get processed by either the leaf itself because it's the child widget that is in the front there, or if it has no, no idea what to do with that event, like a, you know, a normal key press happening while the focus is on, 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 a, on a button, um, then it would get passed on to its parent event until somebody can handle the event. And if none of the um, widgets uh, can handle it, then the application may need to deal with that event, or it may be something that is, uh, you know, needs to go to the window manager. This is the dynamic widget hierarchy. Uh, the one that we uh, see as the, um, as the option to this is the static widget hierarchy. And the static widget hierarchy is essentially um, something that is not consisting of objects, but of classes, right? So here we have um, a typical view taken out of uh, some part of the, uh, the Mac OS um, uh, user interface toolkit. Um, all these things are called NS something because it's based on, on next step and earlier operating system and that still shows in the, in the names. Um, and this widget hierarchy is a class hierarchy. So the view, the NS view, is the top of this hierarchy here um, that has a, a child or a subclass called NS control, which adds the feature that it can actually receive events of some kind. Uh, and then NS control is some kind of user interface component um, that could be a slider or a text field or an NS button. These are all subclasses. So the button in, in macOS is a subclass of NS control, which 
in turn is a subclass of NSU. Um, refined widgets, of course, have mostly the same API as their superclass, um, obviously. Um, and uh, you know, this, the subclassing happens to extend the existing functionality. So in this example, another uh, thing, if you wanted to, let's say, extend this functionality to create a particular button that looks, uh, you know, does something extra, or maybe displays a little uh, video next to the text or something like that, then you would have to subclass that from the NS button and call it, you know, my button or something. And then you could use that widget um, in your code. But the static widget hierarchy is a class hierarchy. It describes how more specialized and more or more extended versions of, of UI to co uh, components are derived from more generic ones. And the dynamic widget hierarchy is a hierarchy of objects that is created at runtime um, and that basically represents your user interface of your specific app as you compose it with its geometric contains relationship. Now, we talked about late refinement when we, when we looked at the window manager and we understood, um, okay, um, a bunch of different people, you know, the application in general uh, or the, um, the administrator of the system uh, for all users or a particular user or even a particular application uh, might want to change the look and feel. And we said we can do that with these, with these configuration files so that the window manager can always use the, the right um, uh, settings for the specific uh, use case. But we also want this to apply to the things that are inside the applications. And stuff like, for example, the color and placement uh, and graphical design of a uh, of of this like feel like a message that you type and then they send it that you might need for um, a simple messenger, for example, application, um, is also something we want to configure. And that's something that the window manager has no direct influence over because it's inside the app these are UITK widgets uh, that the app uses to create its own user interface inside uh, its top level window. And the window manager has no direct access to that. So here's an example of how that would work. A UITK developer might design um, some basic widgets like a, a, a field, a text field um, and a button. And the text field might look like this gray message uh, field there and the button might be completely undecorated, um, a minimized button that just uses some kind of highlight color. Then an app developer creates a user interface and he decides that uh, they want their app to use you know, a particular visual style because they wanna set themselves apart from, from everybody else. Um, whether that's a good idea or not is, is, is another question, but let's assume they wanna do this. So they start, um, for example, either by refining the graphical attributes of the existing um, uh, design, or maybe they actually need to subclass them if they need more um, uh, fundamental changes. For example, it's easy to change color uh, schemes or fonts that are being used or, or, or dimensions, but it's usually not possible to add functionality to a uh, button by just changing some attributes. You need to usually subclass it. And uh, so that, that would lead to the app developer creating this a message field that uses a different font uh, that uses the send button in a different font and visual style and it also puts a little frame around the two of them maybe using the container that we do. So now the app developer has created their uh, design for this for their messenger app uh, field um, and then maybe a user says oh but I want to switch this you know to some kind of dark mode today here I want to change my settings uh, and they want actually to use a different color scheme um, for for their particular purposes. So you can see that we have, uh, again, these three different levels of uh, refinement that could be happening and that uh, people might want to apply at different stages of the application. This should be implemented inside the toolkit. So meaning that the late refinement that we already discussed for the window manager is also the right way to do that um, for providing uh, customizability of widgets. You cannot usually change the behavior um, um, or the type of characteristics that are av is available. Like you cannot add a field like um, rotational, a rotation to it uh, that would require you to subclass it if it doesn't exist. Um, but you can change the values of any characteristics that are being exposed already through the refinement API. And typically that is um, in a graphical UI toolkit for the app developer 
or in some kind of you know, system-wide configuration setting that you saw earlier on um, for the end user. So that's the, uh, that's the late refinement. Um, then we, uh, we look next at the uh, style guidelines. The style guidelines are another part of the UI toolkit. And style guidelines are, as I was saying earlier, they're basically books, right? They're, they're texts, um, documents that describe how to actually use uh, the interface that is the, the interface toolkit that's being given to you as an app developer. Um, the reason why you need these uh, guidelines is because they are one of the two pillars, um, or you could say one of the three pillars that support consistency. So the first pillar here is the guideline that tells the application developer how the UITK is meant to be used. Right? It explains to you um, how much distance should be between, for example, uh, the edge of a window and, and its contents, so that you don't glue you know, things right to the edge of a, of, a, of a parent window. But guidelines are great, but they, re they rely on the discipline of the developers. Right? The developers need to actually apply these guidelines um, so that they get implemented. You could ignore them, right? You could not read the document or say, oh, I don't care. I'm just going to put all my you know, buttons into, shove them all together and put them in the top left or top right corner of my interface here, um, not you know, um, honoring the, the guidelines that, that my um, Windows system UITK is giving me. A second way of, um, and the second pillar of, of these consistent, this consistency uh, is the possibility that the UI toolkit itself can implement some constraints. Um, so for example, uh, if you use a layout container, then that layout container can um, enforce a certain layout on its children. And if you only provide certain kinds of layout containers, um, then it may be impossible uh, to place interface uh, objects at a completely arbitrary position. Usually most interface toolkits don't go that far. They usually give you one sort of uh, emergency exit container if you want, uh, typically called something like a canvas, uh, where you can just throw your interface objects on in your own design if you really choose to. Um, that is because if you only provide uh, fixed containers that only allow certain layouts, then you are, of course, sacrificing a lot of the flexibility of the toolkit. But some things may actually be did, uh, dictated. So uh, a layout container may say that no matter what you do, I'm always going to leave at least, you know, two millimeters uh, of space between the edge of my, my own window space and the first child window. I'm not going to let you glue things right next to it because it just looks ugly. The third place in which um, you can get support for your uh, style design is, of course, in the uh, design system you use. So the interface builder or the visual studio editor. And the way that they do this is by providing you with guidelines. Um, and in this case, I'm talking about visual guides, snapping, um, or indicators that tell you that, oh, you should really align these buttons to each other because they're underneath each other. So please you know, make them, make them uh, align to each other. Or if you uh, try to, for example, in an in, in interface build on the Mac, if you create one window, uh, sorry, one button, and then you push another one under it, it will actually uh, stop that movement at a, look, at a distance that it considers a good standard default distance between buttons. So in this case, this padding that we we're talking about earlier is being suggested by the uh, UI design system, you know, the app that you use to build your interface. And of course, you want the interface builder to implement the guidelines that you read in, in, in the printed document, right, in the PDF. Um, ideally, these two are, uh, you know, trying to get to the same solution. Uh, we can see some examples of that on the right hand side in, in you know, sort of a sketch terms here where you can see measurements being indicated, you know, equal distribution of objects, all those kinds of things that you know from graphic and presentation software. Uh, you can also often find in, in good user interface design systems to help the designer 
of the interface to, to you know, create a visually um, appealing design. Um, the, uh, the Mac user interface guidelines were, I, I talked about this in DIS1 when we introduced the, uh, the Mac, uh, were a uh, sort of a weird effect because um, they included very detailed information about how to use this weird new graphical user interface toolkit that most developers at that time hadn't even seen. And you got to imagine this is a time when, as a developer, I may have not, I may have never seen a graphical user interface. And then I sit down in front of a Mac, I play with it a little, and then I decide to write an app for it. Um, and I have no idea how to do that. So um, nobody had heard of, you know, the notion of um, container widgets or um, you know, callback routines and all those kinds of things. So a lot of that was being implemented um, by writing it down in a style guide that was kind of a primer on how to write good, consistent, standard applications with this toolkit. But it also included commercial pressure um, first from Apple. So Apple really sent out people to tell their developers, please make your application quit when the user hits command Q. Please make it make that work and don't use your own keyboard shortcut for exiting the application. Um, and um, the you know the guidelines, but also the user interface toolkit would strongly push user uh, developers to use those uh, standards. And later on, the user community itself started to um, you know become snobbish, if you want, uh, if an application was uh, strongly breaking the guidelines and felt very well, they would say unmac-like, but it felt very much like it was ignoring the standard guidelines. It would get very bad reviews and ratings. Um, and so commercial success in the end then uh, was in part also depending for the application developer on following the guidelines that Apple had set forth for their applications, which of course benefited the end users because they only had to use one kind of commands and could apply them across a whole bunch of different applications. And nowadays we see that pretty much as a standard that um, apps try to follow these standard interactions in, of, their, of, their, um, of their host system. Okay, uh, let's take a very short break. Um, we have um, a few more things to say about the, um, um, the UI design system, and then we'll be back and uh, dive into the next uh, layer. Okay, um, so we've seen a bunch of different parts of the uh, uh, UI toolkit. Um, we're at the level of uh, the user interface design systems now um, that support you in creating your interface. And um, the ones that uh, started this whole thing were still mostly language oriented. So in the beginning, when user interfaces were um, being created, you often had to basically create the interface by writing a textual description. And I'm not saying that that's a bad idea. Even today, if you can store the description of your interface in some kind of human readable text form, uh, that's actually very useful. Um, how you create that text, uh, whether you do that in a, you know, in a text editor or whether you actually use a graphical toolkit, uh, a graphical application to create it and then save it as text, um, that's a different uh, question. But these language oriented um, user interface design systems, also called user interface design uh, description languages, UIDLs, are typically um, um, a defined, you know, if you want description language, typically XML based these days. Um, and uh, when you compile these, then of course you've got the advantage that you can check certain constructs and make sure that the description of this um, interface uh, follows certain rules. Uh, and we'll see an example for that in, in, just a, in just a second. Today, how you create your interface is usually using some kind of um, uh, drawing application. Right? I showed you an example of um, the, uh, the Visual Design uh, Studio. Um, I mentioned Interface Builder on, on the Mac. These are applications that let you um, graphically draw your UI uh, and um, hopefully also uh, not just do this uh, graphical design, but also using you know, lines connecting user input to, to actions also give you a way to actually provide um, interactivity. So to program the interactivity of your interface in addition to uh, just the, the, its, its look. So you could say the look is, is one part. It's a basically a, a 
a glorified drawing program, um, but the feel of the application, how it reacts, how it interacts with the user, what it does when the user clicks on things, you know, types stuff, drags stuff, that is something that you can often also graphically provide and, and specify in these applications so you don't have to code as much. Um, and what is still a, a, an ongoing research topic pretty much is to create the UI automatically from a specification of the application's logic. Uh, while this is possible for very simple um, application domains uh, that you basically have nothing else to do, the interface is magically generated because it knows what kind of settings the user needs to make and what kind of domains these are, whether continuous values or discrete selections, those kinds of stuff. Um, but as soon as you get into a more um, complex domain, oftentimes these automatic interfaces tend to look, um, well, quite automatically generated, let's put it that way, simply because it's hard for uh, an, an, an automatism to really derive the design insights and to apply the design insights that a good um, graphic user interface designer can apply. But we might well see some um, progress in this uh, now with the with the advent of uh, deep learning and, and advanced AI logic becoming more and more widely available. Here's an example of a typical user interface description language. Um, uh, this is uh, is taken. Uh, this is Zool uh, X U L uh, used to define the user interface of, of Firefox and, and Thunderbird and those kinds of things, um, where you basically define the widget hierarchy in XML and the rendering engine then lays out the items um, accordingly. So uh, what you can see here is um, we have something um, after the you know, the XML header. We've got a window that is being defined and it has an ID. So through which I can refer to it later on in the description. It's got a title that goes into the title bar typically of that, that window. Um, it has an orientation, how it is, uh, how it should lay out things that are uh, contained in it. Um, and then you've got um, uh, a, um, um, and, sorry, <coughs> you got the XUL um, link to it to, to tell you uh, where, where to find the XUL um, basic description. And then you can see after the window, we see in, uh, that the window doesn't end, but it, it contains as children in this document uh, tree here, which simply represents the, the, the widget tree that I talked about earlier, um, two buttons, right? One, one button is called, uh, has a label of normal, and one button has a label of um, saying disabled, and, and that button is also um, disabled, so it's grayed out. And what that leads to then is basically this, this layout that you see here uh, on the right-hand side, where you've got these um, standard uh, things that go into the title bar, you don't have to do anything for that. If we were to make this thing a bit um, bigger, we would probably see uh, the title find files in there as well. That's currently hidden because the window is so small and normal and disabled are placed underneath each other. Um, so uh, that's one example taken from, from this uh, uh, XUL uh, format, the Zool format. But you know, most of these descriptions store their um, designs in, in some similar way. Here's another example um, that is um, interface builder taken from the Mac OS Xcode um, uh, integrated development environment that you use to build applications for Mac OS and also for iOS. Um, and what we can see here is basically on the uh, on the right hand uh, or sorry on, on the on the right hand side we can see uh, that we're currently looking at all the different things uh, we can set uh, for a particular button you know, that, that, is being, uh, that is being configured. Uh, the convert button is currently selected here uh, in this design. What this is doing is, is basically it's designing a, a simple temperature converter interface. Um, you might remember that uh, um, from DIS1. And we can see here that in order to create this user interface, um, the app developer has placed a text field and a convert button and a little arrow glyph here, a, a graphic, and also the string temperature up here um, above the text field. And then we've got you know, two placeholders that will get filled in later with numbers, uh, but that are not supposed to be editable numbers. And then the words uh, degrees Celsius and degrees Fahrenheit behind it. Uh, and currently, since the push button is being selected, the one that says convert, uh, we can see um, all the uh, attributes for that push button on the right hand side here, including, for example, the title, um, uh, which is convert, right? So that's where the, the text is being specified uh, that goes in there. 
But as you can see, there's lots of other settings. For example, at the very top, we can see that the button is currently set to be a push button um, or more concretely, a momentary push and button. So that will pop back out. Uh, but this could be changed to be uh, some kind of other, um, other button design. We can also set whether it should be a bordered button that we can see visually with the border or whether it should, the border should be transparent uh, so that it just is some text that users need to figure out uh, works as a button. And so on and so on. So we can see lots of different settings here, uh, both for the visual design, but also for how, for how it should behave. Um, what I want to uh, point you to is you can see on top of the graphical UI here, you can see a little blue uh, icon and that icon kind of represents your uh, implementation, your code. Uh, and if you wanted to now define an action, uh, you could simply basically connect your user interface with your code by dragging with the right mouse button uh, held down and selecting a method. So the way that this would look is basically, um, I, would, I would start pulling basically from that convert button to this uh, blue little icon here. And what would happen at that point is uh, that a um, selection pops up where I could then select um, knowing that this is a push button. I know that it can do, uh, uh, you know, that it can trigger certain things and what we can see here is we can choose uh, different actions that should happen as a result of, uh, of this push button being triggered. And so for example here, received actions, you could pick something like you know, convert temperature uh, uh, in, uh, in center, right? So that would probably be the call into my code uh, that I wrote that I want to trigger when the button gets pushed. Okay, so, um, that wraps up the discussion of the user interface toolkit. Um, we have um, at its basic, some basic widgets at its, at its foundation uh, that then get composed into more complex ones that we saw like a you know, file save dialog box or a, or a color picker, or we have refinement so that we can create more specific widgets that do things slightly differently than the standard ones that are being provided. Uh, we talked about different shapes and, and varieties of buttons for that. Um, we also saw uh, that the UITK is not just the widget set, but it also contains typically um, um, a written style guide, some interface guidelines that provide your look and feel um, for the developer um, you know, to tell them how their application should use these uh, widgets. And then it typically uh, contains a user interface design system or a, um, a user interface design language, or maybe both, um, that lets you create this application interface uh, with typically these days a graphical um, editor. So with that, we're completing the, uh, the look at our four uh, layer system. We've seen how um, events that come in on the hardware level get passed into the graphics event library. Um, the graphics event library does some formatting to them, passes them onto the uh, base window system. It does this grand sort of uh, central dispatching uh, sorting and unsorting of these things so that the right events go to the right um, uh, windows on the base window system level. Uh, the window manager kind of sits off to the side and makes sure that certain um, controls are being rendered around every uh, window on the every top level window on the screen and also ensures certain layout policies are being followed and the user has a way to manipulate windows on the on the desktop. Um, and then there is the UI toolkit which basically um, is this whole set of wind, uh, widgets that is provided that um, makes up the dynamic widget hierarchy of your application that you built. Um, and these widgets can handle many in modern times, um, these days, uh, many events themselves by you know, inverting themselves, calling callback routines, um, calling other widgets to appear or to disappear. Um, so if you press on an open button, you could tell, it could tell directly some other widget like a file size dialog box to, to pop up because the button that you that you press was the was the button that that should bring up the dialog. So oftentimes there's not much you need to write and code to make that user interface work. Um, and then um, in the end, your application sits on top of that and uses the UI toolkit. Um, but when I say it uses it, we'll actually see that the callback uh, principle that I introduced earlier um, is actually the one that um, it, that it feels more like the UI toolkit is driving your application. So. In graphical user interfaces, um, the programming for the developer these days feels more like 
you are providing little stubs of code that get executed if the UI um, triggers them, right? So if the user presses a button to start a computation or to load a file, then you're gonna be busy in your application doing the things that your application specifically does. Um, but for most of the time, your application will not have to do much because the user is um, initiating all the actions and is, is working with the user interface and your code gets called in these callback routines to execute things that the user requested in some way or other. Now, um, let me briefly uh, now switch over to the, um, to the next uh, topic here. And that will be the first window system that we look at for real. And so far, what you've seen is a reference model. Um, and that reference model didn't uh, come out of the blue, right? It was based on um, a lot of systems that had been studied up to that time um, you've gotten the reading assignment for the, um, uh, for the, uh, that, that talks about these different um, uh, window systems that will be part of the reading assignments for this class. And the X window system is probably the most similar to the reference model. Uh, the X window system um, was developed um, as a uh, response from the MIT to the W window system. And, the examples here show you the incredible ingenuity that uh, programmers at the time had to name their projects. Um, so uh, folks have implemented the VOS at Stanford um, and um, called uh, the Windows system for that, the W Windows system, very in ingenious. Um, and that W Windows system uh, did something very strange. This was in around 1982. Um, the W window system moved the base window system and the graphics event library to a remote machine. Um, instead of doing local library calls into the base window system and the graphics event library, it replaced these with a synchronous communication protocol. So every time the base window system or the graphics event library were being called from the UI toolkit and the higher levels, the window manager, the application, um, this was being replaced by a little call that went across the network. Why did they do this? Well, First of all, separating it so cleanly with an internet level uh, communication protocol actually made it much easier to port the underlying uh, system to a new architecture because a new architecture, a new computer architecture would simply have to support a certain very clearly defined uh, protocol calls that came in over the network. It just had to support listening to network communication of a certain protocol and then um, you know it could run under whatever operating system, whatever language you wanted. It didn't matter. Um, you didn't have to compile code together of your application with this underlying um, uh, base system. So it made it easy to port to new architectures. Uh, it also allowed you to actually use um, high-end, high-performance machines. Um, running application code, for example, code simulating some complex physical process, and then render the output on a very uh, lightweight but graphically capable machine, like a graphical terminal in front of the user. And this will, by the way, lead to the biggest confusion people have about uh, X, uh, at least uh, what I hear from students. In X, the server is the thing that sits in front of you that you're looking at, and the client is running on a machine that could potentially be a big uh, number crunching mainframe in the basement. Uh, so it's, it's the opposite of what you might think. Anyway, um, what the developers uh, at Stanford found, uh, Asante and Reed, was that the, the W window system was slow. Uh, it was running under Unix. And one of the things that made it slow was the synchronous communication between uh, the client, so the application and the UI toolkit and the uh, window manager, and the server, you know, being the base window system, graphics event library, and the underlying OS. And synchronous communication, we know, is slow, right? You always have to wait for a round trip before you can continue. So waiting for a round trip over networks in the 80s was no fun. Uh, so what the MIT did is they improved uh, this by, in, in 1984, by replacing the synchronous calls of the W system with asynchronous calls. And because they were even more ingenious in, in inventing new project names, they took the next letter in the, uh, in the alphabet and they landed at X. So they called this the X window system. Um, in the X window system, uh, 
the client is the application running, it calls um, the X library or Xlib for short, um, which uh, packages the, uh, the commands that are coming in and sends them over the, to the X server. Um, and the X server is this uh, thing running on the user's des uh, desktop machine, uh, displaying the results and taking user input uh, and executing the drawing commands that it receives from the client um, and passing the events back um, to the client. Um, this was, by the way, uh, similar to the Andrew system that also was developed at CMU at the time, Carnegie Mellon University, but the window manager here uh, was separate in the X window system, so very um, sort of comp compartmentalized and very flexible in replacing anything uh, uh, in that system. The X10 system was the first public release. Shortly after that followed the X11 release, uh, which was the cross-platform redesign, and that lasted on for at least 20 or 30 years to be sort of the de facto um, cross-platform um, available on everything under the sun kind of uh, window system. A lot of workstations in the 80s, 90s, and up to the 2000s uh, would support running X as a server so that users could execute cl X client apps that have been compiled on some machine um, and display the input and output um, um, on, their, on their desktop uh, machine. You can even download an X uh, server for current versions of, of you know, like Mac OS or Linux, of course. Uh, Linux is actually using flavors of OS to this very day um, and, and you get them for Windows as well. So uh, this is a picture you should remember. Uh, this is the key architecture of X. Um, let's start with the uh, bottom up view, right? So let's say the user presses a button, right? Uh, that would go through the hardware at the bottom here, um, um, which is where the X server sits, into the kernel operating system and get passed into the X server. This contains the base window system and graphics event library. Um, then we get the network cut. So the X server would send that event over to the Xlib um, of the application and the application would then basically uh, take that event and uh, pick, you know, pick out, okay, what does that event mean for my application, which widget was being uh, clicked on uh, and would react accordingly. Easier uh, way to imagine this is when we think about a drawing command. Let's say your application wants to uh, draw a circle. Well, it, you know, a circle is a simple drawing command. It doesn't need any uh, user interface component to do that except a drawing canvas. So it would go right into the Xlib, and that's why this is a staggered set of blue boxes here. The application can call Xlib calls directly for simple graphic commands like line drawing or circle drawing, and it can call more complex things like creating a push button um, by calling the widget set. And I'll talk about the intrinsics in, in a minute. So let's say the application draws a circle, it calls the Xlib, the Xlib packages this call for drawing a circle up into a little network pack, package, sends it down the network for the X server as a, as a recipient uh, with, the, with the internet address of the, of the X server. Um, and the X server would unpack that and draw that circle on the user's display that's sitting in front of them. The application therefore could run on a completely different computer, maybe a high-end mainframe that had a lot of uh, compute power at the time. What about the window manager? Well, the window manager in X is also just another application um, it doesn't need an extra widget set or anything like that. So it would call the Xlib directly and uh, would use that to decorate the windows um, with consistent, in a consistent way and provide some session management. X, as I said, is pretty close to our four layer architecture model. Um, the base window system and graphics event library sitting in the X server and the UI toolkit and the window manager sitting on the client side of the X architecture. Um, the X server in itself, you can zoom into it a bit um, and imagine it as consisting out of two layers, um, the device dependent one and the device independent one. This is where we're hiding uh, specific, uh, you know, specialties of particular hardware or operating uh, details. Um, in a way, uh, you can assume that the X server is responsible for one keyboard and, and, and mouse, of course, but it can handle multiple physical screens, so displays uh, connected to it. Um, and uh, provides basically the, uh, the base windows as the canvas for, for the clients on the level of the base window system. X11 is actually standardized as an ISO standard, um, but there are also limitations because uh, the 
X protocol that is implemented basically defines exactly uh, what the base window system and the GEL can do, right? Uh, so it's hard to extend without changing the, the X protocol itself, uh, but it's lasted uh, you know, well enough for, for a couple of decades. Um, applications, including the user interface toolkit uh, and the window manager are clients in this model. Um, and uh, the, the graphics event library in this, in this uh, X model uh, we got to remember this was designed in the 80s, so it is actually initially based on a very simple model. Direct drawing, no, um, no buffering uh, on the level of the GEL. Uh, it's a raster model, so no vector-based drawing, but uh, pixel-based drawing. So it was assuming that you, know, you would be told how big your, your screen is, and it would basically work with pixels on that screen. And it uses uh, rectangular clipping, so basically just clipping regions that are, that are little boxes. Um, the base window system can optionally be turned on to buffer uh, output regions so that the application doesn't have to do it, um, uh, which, of course, is a, is a nice touch in, uh, for the application developer that they don't have to worry about refreshing the contents of every uh, window that has been painted in or something by the user um, every time uh, a dialog pops up and disappears again and, and, and exposes that. So the base window system can take care of that if the application chooses to. Um, the X server itself is also a fairly simple construct. It's a single entrance server, uh, works in a round robin fashion. Um, so it basically gets, an, gets an, uh, a request from the, uh, from the client and it processes it, whether it's drawing a circle or, or um, drawing a line or doing something else. Um, and the uh, X server is, and that is interesting, a user level process. So. When you think about an operating system like Unix, Linux, uh, you got your kernel um, running and everything above the kernel is in the user application space. So these are applications that you as a normal user can terminate right, and, and launch. Um, and they don't run under a special protection of the kernel. Uh, and in, in the X window system, that is the case. So the graphical um, environment uh, on top of Unix is all running in the user space, uh, which makes it easily exchangeable um, but also means you don't get the benefits of, of kernel level execution. We talked about this earlier when we discussed where to place the base window system. What's the X protocol look like? Um, typically, um, so it's running between the client, you know, your application, you know, maybe a drawing application or something, or a, you know, a, a web uh, browser or something like that, and the server. Um, the server being the machine in front of the, the, the user. So, uh, you know, typically um, it's an asynchronous protocol, as I said. So the first packet gets, you know, accepted or refused. But after that, we basically have requests and replies. But the X protocol allows for the user to, uh, for, for the client to send requests one after the other. It doesn't have to wait for the reply. Um, so it's a bi-directional byte stream, uh, the transport layer of the, um, of, of, uh, the internet protocol guarantees the order. Um, it's implemented in TCP, but also at the time there were other protocols beside TCP. Hard to imagine these days, but um, uh, X was also implemented for these other protocols like, like DECnet, for example. Um, the developers of X found that at the time it created about 20% of a time overhead um, running an application over the network. Um, each packet would contain basically um, the length of the packet, some resource IDs, and some operation codes, opcodes, for what kind of con a call it was. Was it calling to draw something or was it a call to, um, to ask for a new uh, resource like a font or a base window system uh, level window or those kinds of things. The first uh, packets that were being sent contained typically the byte order that was being used and, and information about which protocol version was used and um, any authentication that it expected from the server. After the connection was established, you basically had four different kinds of packet types, and that's very simple. The client sends requests, drawing stuff, etc. cetera. Um, the um, server could reply with these, or the, reply, uh, the server could send uh, an error message that it wasn't able to uh, draw something or execute a request. Maybe you know, it was out of memory or something like that and couldn't deal with handling another window. Um, and of course, the fourth type was the event. Um, any guesses on um, what the most frequent um, 
kinds of, uh, of um, packet types would be in this X protocol. Let's say you put your ear you know, to the line, uh, listening to the communication between X client and X server, and you wanted to figure out what you think is the most frequent uh, kind of packet that gets sent back and forth. Any guesses? Yeah, Richard, go ahead. Uh, events? Yeah, so events are most likely the most frequent one, especially if you pass on every mouse uh, movement to, to the layers above. And um, you typically have to do that because applications may actually want the live mouse position to do things. Right? Not every application needs that, um, but um, you know, some, some are happy to just get the event when the mouse gets clicked. Um, but in most cases, you actually need the, uh, the live uh, event updates. So what does the uh, what does the xlib look like? The xlib is basically um, the uh, a library that to to the top looks like um, a a graphics event library a bit, right? Because the application needs to basically execute graphic commands, um, and to do that, it can all it can do is call the xlib. That's the only thing it knows about. It doesn't know what the X server does with that stuff. That's what the XLib is hiding. Um, the XLib was uh, implemented in a procedural way, so typically program in C. Uh, so if you use the XLib, you're programming on the level of sort of the, you know, the, the base window system, not very comfortable. Um, and at each XLib call, you basically, um, you have one problem, right? Um, it's easy to say the application calls um, the XLib, and the xlib um, executes that, that, that request, like drawing a, a line, and sends that at a package over to the server. But how? How do events get back from the server? That is not clear, right? Because the server cannot by itself talk back to the client, right? There's no way for it to do that. The client dictates when it asks the server for stuff. So the way the... Um, uh, X designer solved that uh, is actually quite a common trick. They said every time any kind of uh, packet gets sent by the xlib to the X server, from the client to the server, we use that opportunity uh, to also send back um, the, um, so the xlib would then also contain a listening mode where it at that point also ask the server if there were any events it should know about. So each xlib call would automatically trigger a listening for more events. Um, as we said early on, mouse position is usually handled and updated by you know, the lower levels, uh, the graphics event library in the basement of the system without being passed up further. Uh, so it was not a problem to, that you would have to constantly listen for events just to listen to hear mouse movements. Um, the mouse update would work nevertheless. But every time um, you called anything, you did any kind of output, um, you would also then automatically get feedback about the, the, the event queue that had built up and would know what kind of events had come in. <coughs> so at each xlib call, it would check for events from that server and create a queue on the client. That's what the xlib did. And you would access those with, with an x get next event uh, just to find out what, what you need to do as an application. Since the xlib is a static library, basically, um, um, that couldn't be um, extended with new functionality, if you wanted to change it, to extend it, you would actually have to change the xlib, and you would have to change the source of the x server, and you'd have to change the, co the protocol between the two. So not an easy way to go. The server would um, provide certain resources to applications in this setting, um, pix maps, windows, graphics context, color maps, Visuals, um, visuals being um, uh, a notion of uh, of a display um, and uh, and its characteristics or fonts. When X talks about the display, what it actually means is the connection to a particular server. So um, one server would basically um, be running. You know, the X server is running. Let's say on your laptop in front of you. Um, and any client app that's running on your computer or somewhere else would call uh, via the X protocol your server and send it uh, commands to execute and would use your 
servers, uh, your X servers IP address and uh, typically socket uh, number, uh, you know, port number to, to connect to it. Uh, this may all seem a little uh, strange. That's why we're going to take a look at a, uh, at a bit of code in Xlib. This is code um, that is very compact and that actually would do something useful uh, if you were running it on uh, some random um, X uh, uh, server. So you, would, you could you know, compile this code. This is a complete application that you can compile. It. All it uses is the Xlib. It doesn't make use of the higher levels. The XT intrinsics or the widget set. Um, and let's go through this so you get a sense for what is actually necessary to happen. Um, so what we can see is that it includes you know, the XLib header and, and some utility headers here from, from X. Um, all the things that were connected to the X uh, window system started with the capital X as a marker for their libraries. Um, and we have a couple of variables. The first variable is also maybe um, the most interesting one. It's the display variable. And I said on the last slide, display was really a, an acronym for, uh, or, or, or stood for the, uh, the X server running somewhere. And as you can see here um, in the first line, uh, that display is a pointer to a, to a data structure and it gets filled by calling the command X open display. And then comes a port number, uh, sorry, sorry, an, an, an IP address. And after that, there is a particular screen number. That screen number basically tells you which screen uh, you are trying to uh, to talk to. So by sending that open, open that that display call, um, you can then ask that display. After that, this display uh, data structure is filled in and is used in all the other calls. You see the D as a uh, as a display struct uh, um, as a parameter. You know keeps popping up right throughout the Xlib application. So every line knows which server it's talking to. If you wanted to, you could write a single application that talks to two separate X servers, right? Drawing things on one and drawing things on the other and getting events from both of them. Um, so a multi-screen application is, is a no-brainer in X. Uh, but we're limiting ourselves to a single um, display or server and a single screen on that. We pick the default screen on that display. Um, and then we set uh, W, which is a window, right? Um, as a data structure here. Um, and uh, the window data structure is basically filled with the X create simple window call here, uh, which uses the, the, the server's connection, uh, asks for a default root window, which is the parent of, of our window. So we're making ourselves a child of the desktop, if you want, on that, uh, on that, window, uh, on that uh, screen. Uh, we provide some uh, X, Y, width and height parameters that we want. Um, we provide a, a, a setting for the border, and we provide what we want to use as the black and white pixels on that display, uh, or rather what this display uses as black and white pixels. So what that means is that by now uh, with this call, uh, we are creating a, a window that knows what it should use as what the display considers a black pixel and what it should use as what the display considers a white pixel. That's really the foreign background. So in theory, if you had a display that was like a, I don't know, green on black display, uh, then you know your your uh, black pixel would actually be green, and the white pixel would actually be um, you know visually black. It's just telling you what the foreign background are on that display. Next call maps that window. What means that uh, that window is actually being um, created um, and actually being made visible on the server. So it means that the window is mapped onto the screen. We're leaving out the graphics context setup here. Um, uh, we're just saying that you know you've set up some uh, values for attributes and masks and and display and and window, and then you call you know creating that graphic context. So this creates your you know you remember that drawing palette of settings with which I want to now um, draw right um, in in any kind. After that comes something interesting that has to do with the event handling. Um, we're saying here that our application, our Xlib application that we're writing here, our little sample application is only interested for, uh, uh, in two kinds of events. Uh, one event is if a button gets pressed on the mouse and the other event type is if the window gets exposed. Exposed means um, that something else covered it and it's now uncovered. Why are we asking for exactly these two, two um, 
kinds of events? Well, we're asking for the button press because that's our uh, signal to quit the application. This application doesn't do much useful stuff. Um, it wants to exit when the button gets clicked, that's all. Um, and when it gets exposed, meaning that the window becomes visible um, and needs to redraw its contents, um, then if we get that kind of event, uh, then we want to draw a line into it, a diagonal line. So that's what we do here. We have a, an endless loop, and that's very typical of graphical user interface programming. You basically run in an endless loop, and somewhere in some kind of callback, uh, you typically exit your application. So while true, this runs forever, basically, um, we get the next event from our display, right? So in this case, I'm calling explicitly the, um, the, the function from the xlib that gives me the next event that, was, that has built up in the queue that the xlib has been pulling from the, uh, from the server. And uh, again, related to the display, and it fills in um, a data structure called E here in this case. We defined this as an X event, as you can see in line two of the code. Um, and as we, as we switch um, the, um, we have a switch statement, statement here based on what type of event we're seeing. If we're seeing an expose event, then we take that as, oh, we need to redraw ourselves. So we draw a line um, on that display, on that window that we have in the, on that display uh, with the graphics context we've loaded up. Um, and we draw it basically um, in the width and height uh, that, we, that we want. Uh, we start at some coordinates, x, y, x, and y. In this case, that would actually have to be uh, zero, zero if we wanted to draw uh, fu fully because we're now in a, in, a, um, in, an, in a local coordinate system for that window. Otherwise, if we get a button press event, we exit the program with an exit statement. And that's it, right? Um, so this very simple program would basically create a little uh, window. That window would uh, then be taken by the window manager and get decorated automatically uh, if the window manager exists. But right now, we're just talking about the xlib, right? Uh, and then it would basically just be a little rectangular area on the screen. And the first time it's mapped, that also means that it, it's exposed, right? So the very first time it's mapped, it would get an expose event back from the window system. Um, and the base window system would say, hey, you've just been mapped for the first time, draw your contents and redraw yourself. And that would basically be an exposure, uh, an exposed event. And so we would draw that little diagonal line. Um, and then the, uh, the, we would basically do that every time we uh, receive that event. The user could now move the, that window around on the screen and nothing would happen inside the app. The app would not know that it gets moved around. Why would it, right? It doesn't care. And basically only when the user clicks inside the window, when we receive that click event, when the base window system decides that our xlib window was the target of that event, then we would interpret that to mean to exit and to close the application. So not a very enjoyable way to program, but on the other hand, you can clearly see that it's in, uh, you know, what is going on and how precisely uh, we are handling that kind of uh, drawing command. Let's look at the, uh, the next level up. The designers of X were, they were really computer scientists, I gotta be honest. Um, they abstracted the hell out of everything. So rather than saying, oh, we're now gonna give you a user interface toolkit, um, that works with the X window system. They said, no, 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 we're gonna create a framework that lets you create user interface toolkits. And then we're gonna give you a sample user interface toolkit, but you're free to exchange that for other, tool for other user interface toolkits. And that's why they are uh, the toolkit intrinsics, the XT intrinsics. So the XT intrinsics are generic functions to work with widgets. They don't, they basically provide everything you need to create and implement an object oriented widget class hierarchy. Um, they also give you, you know, a programming library and a runtime system to handle those widgets. What do I mean by this? Well, um, on the one hand, it gives you the option to say XT create widget, you know, some kind of thing. Um, but also it lets you do things like manage these widgets or, or map them or, or realize them. And these things are uh, different states that uh, a widget can have in the X window system. And you will see similar states in most window systems. So let's go through these four. Um, a widget in, in X can have four different states. 
The first one, it's created. That means it's a data structure that exists. Um, it's linked into the widget tree uh, on the client, but it doesn't have a window yet. It doesn't have a window in the base window system associated yet. So the server doesn't really need to uh, know about it yet. Then you manage it, which means uh, you determine its size and position. That is basically done by the window manager, or maybe if the window manager has nothing specific to, to ask about, then the application itself can say how big it should be. Next, it gets realized. And realizing is when the window actually gets allocated on the base window system level, so in, in the X server. Um, nicely enough, if we've built up a complex hierarchy of like, you know, a, a, a document, a top level window with buttons and, and sub windows inside it, and they're all parts of a widget tree. If you uh, then realize the top level, that realizes also all the children of it. So they all get created in the server um, through that. They're still not necessarily visible. They get visible, rendered on the screen only when you map them, right? So when you render them. And just to make things even more complicated, even when you map them, they may still not actually be visible on the screen because that just means that the window system uh, the base window system will paint them on the screen if they are at the top, but if something else is on top of them, then the, that window would still be invisible, right? It would not be visible to the user. But it means that the application at that point can assume that the moment it gets uncovered, you know, basically the window would be visible to the end user. So these different states are almost like a life cycle of, of, um, of widgets. And uh, they happen in many Windows systems in, in a similar way. That's why these uh, different functions are interesting to, to understand and these different states are interesting to understand. The functions in the XT toolkit give you options to, you know, they're called like XT realize widget to, to realize the widget that you created before. And the widget class is something that you would basically define yourself. You could define your own widget set with that. Um, the XT intrinsics also take care of dispatching events. Um, so basically it provides you a way of creating this input table and that action table and then map inputs to actions in this translation table. So every widget in X has this input and action list and has a table that maps inputs to actions. So when this button gets pushed down, it should call the following callbacks uh, in, in the list that is stored inside the button. If the button you know, gets released, it should you know, issue a button clicked event and call the following callbacks in this button clicked event list. Um, what's really interesting, and that is different from other uh, uh, toolkits at the time, is that uh, widgets can handle events alone. That is a, uh, a benefit of the object-oriented structure that we have. Um, you don't need to write uh, an event loop inside your application. Uh, instead, X, the X toolkit intrinsics has a function that basically says take over and get events and distribute them appropriately and then all your application has to do is wait for events and its callbacks. We saw earlier on in the XLIP from, uh, program that we wrote that we still had to write our event loop ourselves, right? We actually had to say get the next event and what is it and do the, pro do the right thing. And that kind of basic event loop is stored is, is being executed by the toolkit the moment you move up from the, the pure XLIP program. So everything you do in your application is basically uh, register callbacks with certain event, uh, with certain widgets and say, if that button gets pressed and issues a button clicked event, I would like to be notified and would like to be executed uh, as, as a piece of code. The widget set then, then finally uh, in, in X is um, a, you know, doesn't have to have any functions um, uh, that define this programming model because it's already given in the in the XT intrinsics. So it's just a collection of different user interface components and defines the concrete look and feel of the system together with the window manager. Now brace yourselves because I'm going to show you maybe the ugliest widget set that you have ever seen. Uh, this was the original widget set from uh, the MIT developers, and you can tell they were excellent software developers, but maybe not so great graphic designers, um, because their widget set, which they called uh, Athena widget set, because the whole project was called Project Athena, 
uh, looked like this. So it had um, a simple widget, which was the base uh, uh, class for all the other Athena widgets. All the Athena widgets, by the way, they start with the um, prefix XAW, X Athena widget. Um, and the simple widget doesn't do anything, but it adds resources like the cursor or a border pix map. So where you could say what kind of um, uh, pixel drawing would you like to use for the border. And then we have a bunch of standard widgets, labels to, to render text that isn't editable, or a toggle button that you can press. And every time you press it, it toggles from on to off, right? Uh, a menu button that you could press to then um, attach a menu to that could then pop out when you press the button. Uh, a list, which could actually be uh, a two-dimensional list, as you can see here, in rows and columns. Um, that would allow you to select one string from that list. A scroll bar that lets you set a value by moving the slider back and forth. Or um, you know, a radio button that you could press and uh, toggle on, uh, and, and, or uh, turn on to press. And if you pressed on another radio button from a group of radio buttons, then all the others would turn off. So it's a one out of n selection. Um, or we have things like uh, um, a, a form widget, which lets you, it would, this is one example of these constraint widgets that would actually let you um, position children relative to each other. So you could say, you know, left off or right off or above or below. Or a, a simple dialogue widget would, that would have basically a text field and, and a bunch of buttons um, for, for simple dialogue buttons, uh, for to simple dialogue boxes. Uh, Athena also provided some widgets. The ones that I've talked about so far are things that you see also in many other toolkits. Athena had a, a weird and eclectic choice of additional widgets. Um, it had, for example, a special widget that was a repeater. So the repeater was a button that you would press and the, while you hold it down, it would have an auto repeat like a key that you press on your keyboard. Um, so it would repeatedly call its you know, uh, callback function for as long as it is being held down. Another one that I, I really like that one is, is a panner. The panner was a widget that was like a, a scroll bar in two directions. So you could basically move it in X and Y um, and select an X and Y position inside a larger space. Very useful with, together with the porthole right next to that, uh, which was a composite widget that allowed a larger widget to be windowed within a smaller one. So you could basically show just a part of a window and then have the panner to move through that. You actually sometimes see that still today. If you think about how you navigate through uh, pictures in Photoshop, for example, or Illustrator, uh, you often have these little uh, miniature maps that you can move around uh, your cursor and then you will move, that will move you through your view. Often that's easier than using scroll bars. But scroll bars, of course, existed as well. Uh, you can see the viewport there. That's a typical uh, constrained widget like a portal, but it had scroll bars attached to it. Um, so that's a typical composite. Um, that could contain these different things. Um, for whatever reasons, there was a strip chart. So you could basically create a little bar graph um, directly as a, as a widget. You wouldn't have to build that yourself as an application. And there was even a widget for a tree. Um, so you could uh, lay out things in, in tree form. You can see these were computer scientists designing that, that widget set. They figured that a tree uh, layout was very important to have as a widget. And a gauge uh, that could show a value in a, in a, in a in this little uh, you know, uh, thermometer-like display and that you could label with, with, with tick marks and, and labels. Now, Athena was technically working and there were actually quite a few um, programs written with the Athena widget set, but it was also dead ugly and uh, not very convenient to use, neither for programming, not for, for the end user. And by that time, we have to imagine this was in the 80s, so uh, you know, Mac and, and Windows were coming around as well. Uh, and they looked a little more spiffy. Um, so what um, uh, happened then was that uh, the uh, motif widget set was developed as, um, as a follow-up of that. Um, and the, uh, the motif widget set was basically giving you um, a much more um, advanced look that looked a little more modern and had a sort of um, 3D or three, uh, two and a half D look that looked a little more in line with the, the visual aesthetics of the desktop operating systems at the time. We'll talk a little bit more about the motif widget set um, next week, and then we'll see uh, where the X-Windows system was taken 
after the initial sort of two or three decades of, um, of the X11 uh, system. For now, I would like to wrap up. Thanks everybody for, um, for listening and being part of this uh, live presentation here. Um, I will see you guys again um, next week for, to continue this discussion, um, but uh, we'll also have um, Sebastian running the, the lab on this coming Monday. Thanks everybody. And uh, Sebastian, I will stay online here for um, a few more minutes. If anybody has a question, they would like to get uh, off their chest. So that famous walk up to the professor and teaching assistant after class moment. Uh, you can now do that by just staying in the connection. Otherwise, uh, you can sign off and uh, thanks for joining us. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.